I'm uh, David Mortman, and I'll be your uh, erstwhile moderator and loudmouth for the day. Alex? I'm Bruce Schneier. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm Adam. Sh I'm Alex Hutton. I'm Alex Hutton. Dan Crisp. Jerry Dixon. So uh, today we're going to talk about, um, there were a lot of vulnerabilities released in the last few days here at uh, Black Hat, and uh, you're probably wondering, which, which of them do you need to worry about, and which of them do you not need to worry about? And uh, you may have read about some of them in the press, um, and others that might be of a higher impact you may not have read about in the press. We'll find out as time goes on. Um, so the big question that comes up a lot is, what do you need to worry about, what don't you need to worry about, and when do you need to worry about it? So uh, we'll dive into it quickly. So the first thing you need to remember when, you're, uh, when you get your list of vulnerabilities is that a list is a good place to start, but it's not actually the most useful thing in the world. Um, after all, you, know, you make a shopping list for, to go grocery shopping, and you don't necessarily you know, need everything on the list, and perhaps the most important thing on the list isn't at the top of the list, and you need to make some decisions, and that pretty much applies to uh, vulnerabilities as well. Um, and the other thing that you need to know is that actually um, the sexiest vulnerability that you see is not always the one that you need to be worrying about the most. Um, especially when you're at an event like this conference or similar conferences, you're going to see a lot of really cool, really exciting things that um, from a, you know, a technical perspective or a geek perspective, you're going, whoa, that was so cool. And then you sit down and you think about it for a while and you go, wow, I don't have any of those on my, in my organization. Or we're not going to buy any of those for three years. So I guess I won't really worry about that right now. Um, so I'm going, to take, I'm going to back off on the presentation a bit because I'd really like to hear from my panelists here on how, how do they prioritize vulnerabilities today within their organizations. Okay. So what, I, what I'm going to do is kind of give a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going back to my previous job when I was in government. Uh, when I was running the National Cybersecurity Division, we were usually the point person for the secretary to, to call to ask when he reads about something in the news, how bad is a particular vulnerability, you know, what should I do about it? Uh, I mean, to give you an example, one of the questions you know, that the secretary would ask is, you know, who do we need to communicate with? Do I need to go on CNN, Fox News, you know, pick one of the mainstream medias and tell people don't connect to the internet? You know, we're like, you know, no, no, it's not, not quite that bad, but we had to come up with a reason why we didn't think a particular vulnerability or uh, an event was that bad or if it did rise to that occasion. The other thing it would factor into that decision making was whether or not he had to recommend to the president, do you need to change the, uh, the Homeland Security uh, alert code, you know, the warning code. So as part of that, we kind of had a, a home-baked um, process where you would look at, you know, is it actively being exploited? Is it being seen across the globe? Is it a regional thing? Uh, is it something that the vendor can quickly take care of? So there's a lot of different variables when you think about looking at decision trees and models. Uh, you know, the other big question that always pops up is does it warrant a law enforcement, a military, or intelligence response? Uh, these are all different tools that are available to you, including diplomatic. Uh, so in, in order to do that, you really have to have a, a decision tree in place, one that's been formalized and accepted by the organization to help triage all the different information that's flying into your operations center. Jerry, Jerry did you say decision tree? That's exactly what I said. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. And that, that's my piece up. Dan, go ahead and introduce, tell who you are. Because, uh, oh, uh, I'm Dan Crisp. I'm the um, Chief Operations Officer with Barclays Bank in London. Um, and a lot of our bank's focus in the last uh, three to five years has been growing in emerging markets. So in the last three years, we've, we've entered Pakistan, uh, Russia, and Indonesia as new markets for us. So a lot of our focus around vulnerability is, is related to geographical location. Uh, what are the risks of, of doing development in a place like Shanghai? Uh, what are the challenges of going into Indonesia and buying a bank license that's, uh, that doesn't even have computers? We just needed the licensing to get into that market and then we're going to build it from scratch. Uh, what are the challenges of going into Moscow? And you find that all your security people are ex-KGB and you have to get them to interface with the people that work for Barclays that are mostly Secret Service, uh, former Secret Service, former Interpol, and things of that nature. So a lot of our focus is, uh, the, the message we get from the business loud and clear is, is that we're going to this market. It's, it's not an option, it's, we're just simply going to do it. 
um, and how do, we, how do we do this in the most secure way possible. And so a lot of our focus is n not only looking at uh, the, the stuff from the, from the U.S. government agencies, but, but balancing that information with um, uh, the British Foreign Service as well as the French, uh, the Japanese, Australians, and uh, the Germans. And then we get a more balanced picture about where we can take our risks, uh, what, we're, what, we're, what we're up against, and we lay those risks out to, to senior management by way of our um, vulnerability models. Um, the other thing that we're very uh, keen on is that our models uh, work more quantitatively than they do qualitatively. Uh, because we are in a business that operates for a profit, and uh, we are challenged at the end of every uh, deployment, every time we enter a country, uh, to show that we are adding value, that the, that the cost of security is being borne, and there is there's uh, residual risk reduction based on the vulnerabilities that we've discovered and, and the ones that we've offset through risk mitigation. Um, Dan, um, I wanted to um, stress something that uh, I think I heard you mention. You have um, a model selection process even, is that correct? Yes, yes. I, when I started at Barclays, my background was uh, working in U.S. banks uh, in risk management uh, by way of Basel II. Uh, a subset of that was information security risk by way of operational risk. And uh, when I came into Barclays, uh, the, the vast majority of their models were qualitative. And that those weren't easily transferable. Uh, in fact, they were looking at um, a country the way they looked at a vendor almost. And so we set up competing models, uh, quantitative and qualitative models uh, of, of uh, vulnerability analysis. And uh, we let those uh, models challenge one another in country by country, market by market. Uh, and we also use those same models when we're bringing in new vendors and, and uh, n new partners into the business. I, I just want, and, and high other side of the room. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, mention that I think that's uh, very interesting because if um, anybody in here has dealt in, in quantum mechanics and so forth and the probability theory within that, a huge piece of that is uh, Bayesian model selection. Um, you have to, you know, find the right model first before you can even start thinking about addressing whether or not your results um, are, will arrive you at a state of knowledge. Um, anything else uh, that you want to add on top of that, Jerry? No, I just think that, uh, you know, one of the key things when you look at decision trees and, and how you're going to determine what action your organization is going to take, you know, I think a lot of times you know, when a, a vulnerability or something's out there, a lot of times it's just easier just, you know, just patch it. You know, that, that's kind of my philosophy in general in these days. But when you've got to think about if I've got to communicate to senior leadership, if I need to get their buy-in, maybe I need to go to the senior vice president, or in the case of government, I'm going to be sitting there in front of the undersecretary and secretary being bombarded with questions. You've got to be able to demonstrate this is why we arrived at the conclusion that we did. Of course, knowing that all things are fluid and you got the fog of war kind of playing into some of this. Uh, but you've got to be able to show a process of how you arrived at your decision, how did you come up with your uh, recommendations. Uh, when it comes to the communications plan within government, do you just communicate amongst government agencies and operational teams? Do you communicate to all the chief information officers across the federal government? Do you communicate with the general public at large? And so uh, within government, you absolutely have to have a flowing process and, and a decision-making process nailed down and being able to, uh, to defend it. That, um, and basically, um, what I want to open up to both Jerry and Dan, um, what you find interesting about the ability to communicate and the, ne and the necessity to um, basically communicate based on, on a rational premise and you gotta especially communicating to people who are um, not technically inclined. Uh, thoughts, comments? Thanks. You know, back back to the thing of uh, you know, the secretary asked me, do we got to tell everybody to disconnect from the uh, the internet? You know, we kind of have to put it in terms of, you know, would you tell everybody if there was a major problem, with, say, with the roads or streets? You know, there, there's a certain level of risk that you have to accept every time you go down the street. We got seat belts, we got airbags. Same kind of thing when you're looking at a decision tree. Do you have firewalls? Do you have intrusion detection? Is it actually monitored? Uh, you know, so all those different types of things got to factor into the, into the decision process. I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, I'm going to stand up here because it's annoying to try and see all, all over there. Um, I have the uh, um, 
just the, the, the wonderful honor of working with the group at, in risk intelligence at Ryzen Business. And we put out a report called the Data Breach Investigations Report. Um, and basically what it does is it takes um, all the incident cases that Verizon sees and services, anonymizes the data, and then performs a, a analysis and a, and a report that protects the clients, but actually hopefully gives us data uh, to use, because data is hard to come by. Um, and so when we talk about vulnerability, and we talk about decision trees, right, and we talk about our ability to communicate, one of the things that uh, I think is important is to do that within the context of data. Now, the Verizon report um, has, a, has an applicable uh, sort of sample size. It is not necessarily, we don't ever get called in if um, the wrong VLAN goes away by, you know, some spastic problem with change control or if there's a lost laptop, right? You don't need to pay a third party to come in for that. But what we do get called in for is when there are significant breaches that involve credit cards and PII and those sorts of things. And so one of the great things, and I, I just brought a couple of, of slides up, one of, the, one of the great things that we found is out of 600 incidents, right, this is um, the time uh, an amount of, of uh, the patch was available. So it, somebody hacked in, they did something bad, how long was a patch available for what the bad guy exploited? And if you take a look, the vast majority of them, they were around for, oh, over a year. Okay, so backing up to the, the sexiest vuln may not be the one you should be worrying about. We have a little bit of data that suggests that. The next slide, this um, shows um, the threat category, how actually the threat action category. And you'll notice the error bar at the bottom, the 3% that is black out of that error, uh, uh, breach due to error, that is where actually the internal person did something and messed up, right? The gray bar is when there was a misconfiguration or a process error that contributed to one of the other threat categories. So it represents overlay, that's why it's gray. All right, so what that suggests is, A, the patches have been around, B, we've screwed up somewhere in policy and process uh, to just exacerbate the situation. So actually, if you could uh, go back a slide, Alex. Oh, sure. um, so what these last two slides uh, have shown us is that um, What's more important than getting patches out is getting patches out or configuration changes to you know, any sort of compensating controls out is not just to get it out fast. In fact, fast isn't really an issue. The important, is to, the important part is to do it very consistently and to do it 100%, um, which means you need to have a lot of operational discipline. You need to have really strong policies and procedures that you can do that are very repeatable. You can do them absolutely consistently every single time. It's these misconfigurations, it's these er human errors that lead to these issues. Um, if you uh, read the full Verizon report, one of the things that was a consistent factor across almost every single breach was either default credentials or credentials that should have been removed when someone either left the company, whether that was voluntarily or not. Um, this is a basic process issue that if more companies followed, they would have a, be a lot less likely um, to have breaches. It's not about vulnerabilities in the classic sense. It's not about evil hackers, you know, writing cool code. They went, hmm, the default password is SA. I mean, there's a list, there's a long list out there on the internet of these things. So um, this is where operational discipline um, becomes very important. Um, but nonetheless, whether, when you get these vulnerabilities, you need to decide how quickly do I need to react and which ones do I need to think about and worry about first. I mean, if you have a large enterprise or you're the federal government, um, if there's patches, it's not really that complex an issue to decide. You push the patches out, but in the case of a lot of the issues like ones we've seen today, um, there's other things you need to do. Um, case in point, there was a SMS hacking vulnerability um, that impacted a lot of phones, but in particular the iPhone. And uh, AT&T opted to turn off SMS messaging to all iPhone users for a while. Um, you may have noticed you've been missing some SMS messages today. Um, that's why. Um, but it turns out that um, it's only, they made a little error and that they didn't actually turn off all SMS messages. They turned off text messages to your phone, which you see, um, but also like when a little icon comes up that says you have voicemail, that was sent by an SMS message and they, they didn't turn that off. Um, so that would fall into this category. If someone were to exploit 
um, a vulnerability, a different vulnerability on the iPhone using this, it would fall into that gray bar. It's really a misconfiguration issue, not a, uh, another one of these issues right here on the list. Um, but get backing up a bit, um, so we need, you need to have a way of prioritizing it. And when Alex and I first started talking about this, and we sort of you know, went to other folks and said, we have this idea, we need a, we need a model for prioritizing vulnerabilities, everyone said, well, what about CVSS? The, you know, it's a standard, it's been out there for a while. Um, that's really useful, why aren't you using that? And uh, before I get into my reasons and Alex's reasons for why we don't like CVSS, I was kind of hoping that Jerry and Dan would share their opinion of CVSS and how they use it today within their organizations. Jerry? You know, we, back in, in my current role, I don't really uh, take advantage of uh, CVSS and, and even in, in government because of all the different things that we had to look at from a, a national perspective. It's good for taking a, a, a generic look at, you know, which ones are more severe than others. Uh, it also provides you a lot of great information if you go, go out to the website and, uh, and, and take advantage of the tool. So, from, but from an operational perspective and the types of questions that I had to answer, I was dealing with policymakers and the, and the politicians, so uh, you know, trying to use CBSS to explain decisions or, or assertions that we were trying to make uh, for a particular type of action, uh, it just didn't fit the bill. We've had the same challenge, uh, get, explaining those actions that, that derive from using, using CBSS. Um, we had the same problems. Um, uh, with the business uh, getting um, ISO 27001 or 27005 to, to um, resonate with the business. So we have to, to, to speak in different terms. We have to relate it in, in ways that do make sense to the business. Hence, uh, our own constructed models. We do use it as a check more than anything else. And, and before, uh, before I, it sounds like Dave and I are bashing it, um, I don't want anybody to come away with the impression that I think that the outputs of the CBS process are non-informative. Certainly they are. In many cases, they're all the information we need in order to make a decision. It's just that at times, um, I think we've all, all of us who have been in the, uh, who have looked at particular vulnerabilities within that context, say, mm, 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 here and there about it. And what, getting back to what Dan said about model selection, it's just another tool in, in your toolbox there. Um, and with that said, um, so Dave and I uh, built a, another tool um, on a different premise for almost a different purpose, for, but similar to a, almost, <coughs> let me back that up, for a somewhat similar purpose to CVSS, but at taking a little bit of a different tack. And I'll let uh, Dave start it, uh, with the explanation. So, uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the themes we discovered when talking to a lot of folks is, you know, they like CVSS, um, but it missed uh, one very important aspect that it didn't do as well as it did for other areas, which is it didn't do a really good job of addressing likelihood that a particular exploit was going to actually be created or, or employed. Um, it's been, you know, there's a small factor, says, is there exploit code out there, is there a patch out there, but in general, it's still not the most useful um, metric. Um, and the other issue, as we, you already heard, is that it's not a great tool for talking to executives. So Alex and I thought what we need is a, is a visual tool at this point. So it's very easy. You can look at it, you can use it very quickly, and it's something you can show to people who are not security people, and they can get a general idea of how this sort of thing works. Okay. Um, so we, we, we came up with a, it's a two-piece model. Um, this part is, is the more visual aspect of it. Um, we, so we have two curves here. The black line that Alex is kindly pointing to is um, your classic Gartner hype cycle curve. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with the Gartner, who are not familiar with the Gartner curve, the curve, um, you good, Alex? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the curve, uh, you know, when you introduce a technology, people get really excited about it. So that's that first peak over there. And then, people realize that, in fact, it's not quite as good as you imagined in your dreams. Um, it doesn't do everything it promised to do. It's not, you know, platinum coated. It doesn't have spinning rims, and it doesn't have those cool, you know, LED lights underneath the uh, carriage. Um, it's not quite as pimpin' as you thought it was going to be. Um, and then what happens, one of two things happens. Either the technology vanishes and goes away and dies off, in which case, well, we don't really care about it. Um, or people start getting comfortable with it and realize that despite um, it's not being quite as complete as you thought it was, it has a lot of utility. 
Um, and you can look at just about any major existing technology today, and it more or less fits this curve. The peaks are slightly different sizes, but it goes back up, and people start using the technology. And we may, we're making a, a vast assumption here that vulnerabilities, vulnerability development follows the same general trend, which is a new technology comes out, and people start hacking it, and they find you know, some low-hanging fruit or some interesting vulnerabilities, and those get taken care of one way or another. And then interest in that particular technology tends to taper off for a while until enough people have enough time in, in grade, if you will, with the, with the technology to start really finding vulnerabilities. And then the number of vulnerabilities of technology start to scale back up. So it follows more or less that same black curve. Simultaneously, we have the red curve there, which uh, Vanna will point at. And that's an approximation of how technology actually gets deployed within an enterprise or a government agency or anything like that. Now, mind you, these overlaps don't necessarily have to be the the way they are, this was just one example, so they could be all over the map. But the important thing is when these two curves cross, and that's the green area there, that's where you generally need to start worrying about it because it means you have a lot of technology out there, you have a large deployment of it, and the state of the art of breaking that technology is well understood, and it's relatively easy for a large group of people to start analyzing it and finding interesting things, which means that suddenly you have a large attack surface you have to worry about, and there's a lot of people who are potentially very interested in attacking that very same surface. Um, so case in point, uh, a couple weeks ago now when we put these slides together, there was a Microsoft ActiveX vulnerability around, um, around one of the video controls in ActiveX. And in fact, since then, there have been a handful of others, including um, a much bigger to-do one around um, the fact that kill bits didn't actually work for ActiveX controls. Um, so if we apply one of these vulnerabilities to our model, um, you can see that uh, on the black line that uh, we have a little arrow there, and that's really the state of the art of hacking on web browsers and ActiveX and then the entire web 2.0 space is really far to the right. And we, as a research community, really understand how to mess with this stuff. And, you know, there's a lot of Internet Explorer out there. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of copies, possibly billions of copies of it. So. You know, when Microsoft calls up and says, by the way, um, there's a patch that you need to apply for Internet Explorer or for ActiveX, you really want to push that out um, right away. And in fact, on Monday night, I was talking with the CSO of a large uh, regional bank, and according to their data, it was an average of 48 hours from an Internet Explorer vulnerability being published to them seeing attempts to exploit that vulnerability. So this is one of those vulnerabilities that you actually really want to um, deal with quickly. Um, but sometimes this picture is not enough, um, especially when you start getting to some of the cell phone vulnerabilities. There's a lot of cell phones out there within particular small ranges of technology related to cell phones. We really understand what we're doing. Um, but yet we're still not see actually seeing a lot of mobile attacks yet. And so Alex and I had to develop a, uh, a taxonomy that would help us come along a little more. And uh, Alex will dive into that and explain how that can uh, help us out. Is this, oh, good. This is on. All right. So what we wanted to do is figure out what drives that curve, or realistically what probably drives that curve, because this curve is an abstraction, we understand. And using Gartner hype cycle and, and these kind of curves is a, pre, a general presupposition, and we acknowledge that it is a presupposition, and it may be very different. And if somebody points out that it is very different, we will be very, very happy. Um, but using that as a general presupposition, we wanted to figure out what factors would drive that curve of adoption, either a vulnerability exploit development, or if a, we're talking about a specific exploit, its use and its dissemination. And so what we came up with is basically a very, very rough uh, Bayesian sort of model. It is a knowledge model. The outcome is a belief statement, not a counting in nature sort of statement. Right? So it's a little different if you've got a statistical background you know, which side of the fence I'm on. Um, but basically, we want to talk about expectation of development and use here, okay? And the red dots note, uh, notate where actually somebody's going to perform a, hopefully, a risk assessment, either formally, like if it is 27,005, or informally, if it's like the risk assessment you and I make when we try and cross Las Vegas Boulevard to get over there to the O'Shea's. So, for actual development or use, two things have to happen. The first one is there, what we call saturation of vulnerable technology. Uh, and we called it that because it's got a lot of syllables 
and that sounds really cool, but really what that means is there's got to be stuff to exploit, right? Very easy logic. So there has to be stuff to exploit, and that is driven by either can we compensate, right? Are people compensating for the exploit, and is there a bunch of stuff out there, market penetration? So if it's BIOS, right? There just isn't a lot of market penetration, so a new exploit or a new vulnerability found in it, we're just not going to need to worry about it so much. If it's Internet Explorer, that's a different question, right? Under ability to compensate, uh, that's, an, that's inverse, right? Um, what you've got is, do we have an ability to repair, right, or patch, or do we have an ability to apply compensating controls, okay? So those things will drive this saturation of vulnerable technology, right? The other side is something that we call exploit utility. Okay, and under exploit utility, basically, we're talking about is there going to be an exploit and is an exploit useful? So is there stuff for people to hack, right? And can they hack it? Now realize this isn't for specific vulnerabilities in specific instances. This is talking about the general population of assets out there, okay? Uh, and that's, that's a very important uh, distinction. But under exploit utility, what you've got is, from the attacker's perspective, the expected value of systems, right? Is it gonna give them access, or access to other things that will give them access, or access to other things that will give them access, or access to other, et, et cetera? Or does it have resources, computing power and bandwidth that they can take advantage of? Or does it have information, or what we would call expected information, right? Because they're making a probable guess at what is on the system in terms of information. So, and that is volume, and that's driven by volume of information and the expected return on that. So if you have a lot of information that's worth not a lot, that may have a high factor. On the other hand, if you have um, a small amount with a really high expected return, you may, again, have a high factor analysis there. The other piece is the code dissemination factors. Whether exploit is easy to use or easy to develop. And then the nature of the discovering individual, right? Is it somebody cool like Sean Moyer who's gonna come here and talk about it, right? Or is it like somebody who works for a nation state and they're gonna hide it and they're gonna keep that in their tool set? So these are the factors that we talk about driving these things. Again, there is a risk assessment there done. Um, on the organization side, ability to compensate, can we roll out a patch and not expect failure? On the attacker side, on the other red dot, will I get caught, right? The probable frequency and magnitude of using the exploit to them. Any questions? We're, we're calling it the, the Mortman Hutton model because it's, that's, that's really unique. And we'll get to, I'll, I'll go ahead and skip through this uh, since you're writing something down, but uh, we both write for um, a weblog called the New School of Information Security uh, based on the book by um, Adam Shostak. Um, and we, what we want to do is we're going to put the model up there, it's released under Creative Commons, there's some blog posts that discuss where, how and where we define the factors. Um, and you can see more about it there. So, just as a heads up. And, and I'll be, in the nature of being frank and honest, there are parts of this model that I hope you guys would be interested in poking at with a stick and telling us how it could be better. Um, the deductive logic on building the model out, especially on the left side, is not as strong as I'd like. Okay, and I'm hoping to recruit individuals, and we're hoping to get individuals to discuss with us how we can make the model better. And that's why we're putting it up there, and that's why we're releasing it. Yeah. I had a question. Um, I, I got experience doing risk assessments, and I was always taught that there's a much larger picture that we, not, we need to take into consideration when performing a quote-unquote information risk assessment. There's physical risks that we have to be concerned with. There's technological risks that we need to be concerned with. There's man-made 
and some of them natural disaster related, and it doesn't seem like your model addresses that. It's only focused on the technological vulnerabilities to that information faces. You're absolutely right. Risk, um, <laughs> there are all sorts of ways to talk about information risk, um, and I'm pretty familiar with a lot of them. Sure. Um, and this is not at all an attempt to do that. That's why there is actually even a little, little red dot that says risk assessment will be per probably be performed by an actor, right? Because this is only trying to figure out what drives that curve, right? Or what, it, so is it, the curve going to be high? Is it going to be short on the time scale? Or is it just going to die? So, I mean, you should understand we're not trying to replace FAIR or Octave or any of the more formal f risk frameworks. What we're trying to do is actually provide something to help inform them to uh, make a better decision. Yeah, I'll, I'll open up and, and let you know. Um, part of the reason for this is selfish. Um, I work within our risk intelligence group at Verizon. And one of the things that happen is every week we get on these long calls and we discuss everything that we've seen, um, you know, around the net, um, you know, through all of our various intelligence sources. And um, these are not risk statements. They are applicability statements and projective statements. And so what we've done is we've built the model. Um, I built the model to kind of help us because at this, you know, at some point it is who's yelling the loudest sometimes. I mean, I've been in uh, reg you know, large regional banks where policy exception was whoever felt the strongest about it, not what the risk really was, right? So this is built to do something the same thing. Okay, great. You feel like this is a pro going to be a problem that we should do a risk assessment on? Why? Point to the factors, right? And, and let's talk about it rationally and let's discuss it. So it is another tool. That we're not looking to replace those. Okay, thanks. Yeah, please. Oh, hold on. We, uh, yeah, they instructed us to wait to give you these things. So, what I was wondering about is, you know, at, at what point, you know, I know there's patches released for various, you know, software packages and going, going back to that graph, which would be great to get a little bit more explanation on. Um, at what point does it become more applicable to upgrade or replace the system than to try to keep patching it? Yeah, I, I don't have an answer for that one. <laughs> um, that, that, that's, part of, that's part of a business decision. I don't think the model was built to, to really answer. Um, so, I, and, and that's going to be dependent on perspectives. Jerry, Jer, Dan, you want to take that and yeah, I think, be on the model? You know, this is heavily dependent on what you know about your infrastructure and what security controls you've got in place. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe for whatever reason you're still living on Windows NT4, for instance. Some companies will buy that extra Microsoft to sell it to you at a lot of money to continue supporting that OS and coming out with patches just for that. So again, it's really dependent on the end user and, and what they have in place. So you would have to take a model like this and kind of factor in your own variables into into this decision tree. Yeah, one, one thing to keep in mind is that a wholesale upgrading to something does not is not necessarily a guarantee, especially if there's a lot of new code that you're actually any more secure. Um, sometimes you're better off sticking with well-known, well-studied code. Um, case in point, um, I'm sure we'll see a huge jump in uh, vulnerabilities in IPv6 once they get significant uh, deployment out there, even though it's supposed to be quote unquote more secure than IPv4. I mean, I know, I know the example of like BOS was used, but maybe BOS runs a either a revenue generation system for whatever reason, or maybe you've got an embedded OS that's handling your control systems. I would actually end up rating that a little bit higher if it's more exposed, but if it's in its own self-contained closed net, you know, no interconnections, then that would also change the, you know, the variables and how I would respond to react to it. One of the things I'm thinking about is sometimes you, you don't have the choice of upgrading, and I'll give you an example. Um, we uh, do banking in India, and uh, one of the criteria of being a foreign bank in India, you can only grow by five to ten branches per year. So if you want any substantial market share, it's going to take an eternity. So uh, what most of the uh, North American and Western European banks do is uh, they do lots of banking by way of mobile phones. Uh, the typical mobile phone in India is an older generation one, 
which obviously presents security issues. So the, the option of upgrading software isn't there. So, so we use these types of models to drive to the business decision. So if you were to go through these decision trees, what we would be looking for is compensating controls in those areas. And uh, what we've done specifically in India is, is to lower the transaction size to, to compensate for, that, for those risks that are involved with the business. But there's a lot of, especially in third world countries, there's a lot of technologies you just simply don't have a choice. You, that, that's what there is. Uh, if, if we go into South Africa or we go into Uganda, um, we don't even have wired technology. They, they put down a, a branch with a satellite dish and a generator, and, um, and then they're up and running. So, so you have to be able to work within those limitations and then drive these decisions back to the business so that they can make um, compensating controls that they can live with and fully understand the risk. And, and if you really wanted to, to do something cool with it, you actually could. Um, what, what you're asking about is, is ability to compensate there, and we're not breaking out those factors any farther here because it needs more vetting, um, and we're hoping that actually other people will offer stuff for us. Um, and take part, and this will actually grow in community, and we'll be able to change the name because it's grown, grown beyond the initial authors and what have you. But you're talking about, okay, does this stay in production or not, based on the current state of uh, knowledge that we have, right, about the vulnerabilities, right? So do we have an ability to repair, right, if it's in T4, right? Do we have an ability to repair it, or do we have an ability to apply sufficient compensating controls? And if you feel that that's low, and you have enough of those systems in terms of market penetration, and you look at the exploit or the potential to build an exploit that has a very high exploit utility, you might actually come to that decision. But you'd have to do that within the, con within the context of financial variables that aren't represented in the model. Yes, please. So, so I'm kind of lost on the model. And maybe it's the depiction, but I see two red dots, which is actor performs a risk assessment. So are you positing that, the, the, that those are the attributes of the risk assessment to consider? I, I'm, I'm lost on, on, on what we're trying to Yeah. Um, on. What we came up with when we started vetting this against um, some of the stuff that we saw at Black Hat and what, you know, what might actually happen, and we threw it out, and, and we realized that there were other factors that went off into, uh, there would be other kind of branches or other factors that would happen um, uh, in, in specific terms to, to be able to get to that next step in the hierarchy. And those weren't, those weren't um, pieces of probabilistic model that we wanted to dictate in this model, right? So what happens is, is, is let's say that, that we can, uh, that we can sit down in a room and we can all say there is a high expected value of the systems to the attacker, right? Now before we can, what I'm asserting is before we can get to the next step and say that, okay, we, uh, we can agree there's a high exploit utility, we would have to go through a risk model from the perspective of the attacker and say, well, does he believe, he can get, does he believe he's gonna get caught or does he believe he's gonna get away with it, right? And, and yes, that assumes a rational actor and, criminals aren't and all that stuff, but we recognize, we're recognizing there's a dependency there, essentially. Again, not the strongest of models, but it's the beginning. I have a question for Dan. Please. Uh, yeah, at the, uh, earlier, the earlier panel, the NASA gentleman mentioned that uh, he's connected to other countries and they share information, and he had his challenges, of course, uh, he knew that he was very vulnerable and they were going to, there were going to be some successful attacks against him. Now with U.S. banking and this model, it's, different, it's a different uh, scenario here because there's money. Right. And there's the motivation, therefore. So do you use the same model? Do you see the application in banking as well? Uh, we, we use similar models to this that um, we apply. Uh, but once again, let me, let me get across strongly. We use competing models. So... So, um, because uh, in any risk community, you're going to have everybody who's, who's uh, produced a predictive model of some sort, uh, and uh, you know, they're near and dear to people's hearts. 
and uh, so what we do is, is, is we have those as check and balances to one another and then uh, we apply industry standard models as well. Uh, so uh, yes, we do use those uh, and uh, we have to uh, because of the partners and we're, we're in over 70 countries of varying degrees of, of risk. So. Did I answer your question? <laughs> Uh, it, it's always banking's always been of interest to me, and uh, uh, because you have to, as you said, share the. Uh, with, you mentioned earlier the KGB. Uh, uh, I would think it's kind of like giving away a bit of. It, it's it's we're a well-known bank. We're over 300 years old. We're in 70 countries. We operated in countries um, during wartime on both sides of the fence. Uh, we've um, been. Um, uh, in uh, countries where it hasn't been popular to do business uh, I, on an international level, um, and uh, we've we've operated profitably. Uh, we're currently in Zimbabwe uh, with a data center in Harare right now, and uh, we um, do business there profitably in that country. Uh, so, um, the way one of the ways that we do protect ourselves uh, to, to within the trusted network is is through multiple firewalls. And one of the things that is advantageous at Barclays is that we are a loose confederation of countries and companies. So uh, if you were looking at a board type network, it's not that, it's, it's more of a, a confederation of networks, uh, which actually works in our favor from a security perspective. Uh, but it does make it more complex to manage, but, but from a, uh, when someone's in the network, they're not across the entire, the entire network. I actually have a question for you guys. Um, sure. <laughs> this, even though it, you got, you named it a vulnerability assessment model, it, you, it shows that you have multiple different disciplines involved in the decision making process. And you mentioned that you're looking for contributors. So would I, is it, should we assume that if someone wants to contribute, you could use system administrators, people in marketing, people who understand telecom bandwidth, so that you could explode each of these out to come up with a decision logic tree that if it meets this parameter, then you would move yes, no, or things like that. So I guess, is that what you would like from the community to help you with that? Very much so. Um, or at least say, you know what, Mortman and Hutton are idiots, and here's a better one. We'd, we'd actually be happy with that. I, in the Security B-Sides presentation we gave, uh, we you know, offered that models are actually substantiations of hypothesis about how the world works. They're just backed up with pretty pictures and or numbers and so forth. Um, and we wanted, we, we basically said, we hope that the community will start building these and we'll, we'll get formal documentation about whether or not they were useful or not. Um, and well, our assertion was, and we had a nice slide that said, the models don't have to be perfect, they just have to be egoless, right? Um, so uh, one of the, that's one of the reasons why we've put it up um, and, and asked for contributions. Now, Allison will make fun of me for this, um, and, and I probably agree with the reasons why, but you might want to say that expected value of systems there, we're gonna, we could draw on some future uh, revelations from the behavioral economics field, right? Um, you know, and, and, and talk about that. Um, you talk about the risk assessment, red dots there, like, like there's any change in risk management going on recently? Yeah, um, you know, in, in a sense, uh, we're, we're trying to do that. I would love to see somebody you know, um, start applying game theory, right? I, I would love to get with uh, Charlie Miller and talk about, you know, uh, actually the market and how the market would play with it. Um, you know, it, it, it would be great. One of the questions that, that came up in the previous session was, um, uh, the last guy that took the question was talking about um, how the U.S. government is looking at uh, a risk model for uh, what, what value add is security um, giving, uh, what is the percentage of investment of security to the overall IT estate, and they haven't ever looked at it that way before. Uh, that's the world I live in. You know, every day I'm challenged, as probably most of you out there are, you know, what value add are you providing to your business? And um, more importantly, I'm asked to, to quantify that value monetarily and um, show 
how much that I how much risk aversion I've been able to to save the company. So that's why these, these models are very important to us because then we, we're using actual facts and data that we can um, drive those through through predictive models that will tell us uh, exactly how much money we're saving the bank or how much uh, cost avoidance we've, we've afforded the bank. Um, and that's what keeps our investments sustained uh, across our project and our strategic change portfolio. Uh, if we can't demonstrate that monetarily and quantitatively, we will not get funding for, for growth or for, for further maturation of our security model. You just get stimulus money. <laughs> I mean, you're right. When you're looking at it from a government perspective, the thing that comes to mind is service delivery, uh, what we call continuity of government, and then within each department you have what's called continuity of operation plans. You know, so it looks at worst case scenarios. What are the key applications that, you know, what are the critical services that you have to have in place if, if you get a war or if a particular, if there's an attack in D.C.? All those types of things come into play. So, you know, the same thing, you know, if you're under a cyber attack, the same type of factors come into play. So I think that's the perspective. It's not so much on a, uh, you know, return or, or profit margins and, and that kind of thing. It's, it really is focused on delivery of service. You know, same thing, you know, first responders look at. Uh, you know, they've got to be able to handle X amount of calls and be able to get to a particular, uh, get on scene within a certain amount of time. All those types of things come into play. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, over the course of the last couple of days, Alex and I have had a lot of fun uh, going to a lot of the talks, uh, reading a lot of the slides, and we went ahead and, and did our own little analysis of some of the vulnerabilities that were released here at Black Hat. And uh, rather than just going down the list uh, straight through, which we did earlier in the week, and actually wasn't the most exciting part, uh, I thought I'd ask if there were particular vulnerabilities first that people wanted to hear about, and uh, the ones that maybe the ones they thought were the sexy vulnerability. Um, or one that they were particularly concerned about, and we can walk through the model, um, either the graphical one or uh, the uh, taxonomy, and talk about how we arrived at a, a, a particular rating for that vulnerability. Or not. How about the Microsoft ATL one that just came out? Okay, so the Microsoft ATL one, um, this one's actually pretty straightforward. Yeah, um, and in fact, uh, if, uh, Alex, if you pull up the other slide, I, I did. Yeah. Um, so the Microsoft ATL one, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, is involved um, interactions between various components within the browser. Um, this is a relatively new area of study within uh, the, the browser, and what I mean by that is there's various components, whether it's a Java engine or plugins or JavaScript or the DOM and things like that within the uh, browser. People, have, for the most part, have not been poking at how these pieces communicate with each other. Um, Despite that fact, as I mentioned earlier, um, the state of the art of hacking on browsers in general is still really far out to the right on this curve. Um, we really can break browsers. Um, this particular area is of interest because it's, it's, it's greenfield, if you will. Um, and uh, it turns out that uh, the folks who were working on this discovered that they could actually stop kill bits from actually working. Now, kill bits, if you're not familiar, was a technology built into the browser and an accessible um, from the group policy, um, which enabled you to, as an enterprise, go and say, click, that ActiveX control is no longer allowed to execute within the browser. It's a really nice way of dealing with vulnerabilities in ActiveX controls. You don't need to worry about going out there and removing it. You don't need to worry about stopping people from downloading it or installing it. When the browser sees that one come up or try to execute it, it says, nope, I'm not going to do it. However, with this ATL vulnerability, what they discovered was they could actually get around that and say, no, go ahead, execute that ActiveX control, which has the following vulnerabilities in it anyway. Um, so they've just completely stripped that entire level of compensating controls. Now, uh, yesterday, let's see, today's Thursday, Tuesday afternoon, Microsoft actually out of band released a hotfix. Now, to give you an idea, Microsoft about, it's like once every two or three years releases something off cycle, but this vulnerability was big enough um, that they were willing to release one out of cycle so that this vulnerability could be discussed in such a large venue like Black Hat. Um, so given the saturation of the technology and given the uh, advancement of, tech, of hacking the technology, this is something that uh, should be addressed basically immediately. Um, the patches are out. Microsoft patches are incredibly stable. Um, it's been a long time since Microsoft has had to release a follow-up to a hotfix saying, oops. Um, don't do that. Your machine will blue screen. You'll lose data. That, just, that hasn't happened in quite a while. So 
I, most organizations at this point should have a very high comfort level and be able to push that patch out um, because I'm confident that um, there are in fact vulnerabilities and exploits rather for those vulnerabilities already floating around the internet today. Um, by contrast, uh, there was a really cool vulnerability released around smart parking meters. And I don't know if folks have seen these yet or not, they're only in a few cities. Uh, Chicago's put some out, San Francisco's testing them, where you can use a smart card to pay for your parking. Um, but there's not a lot out there. So unless you happen to be the manufacturer of said parking meters, or you're the city of Chicago or San Francisco and these other really leading edge organizations, you're probably not really worried about whether or not um, someone's hacked on this parking meter. So in general, I wouldn't worry about it for your organization today. Now, the thing to think about and consider is that as you move on through time, you'll be deploying more technologies, and it's quite likely that some of those technologies will be very much related to these smart parking meters. It might be power meters for your building. It might be uh, door controllers to lock and unlock your doors. It might be something, you know, it might be a handheld. For if you're a restaurant, you might have handhelds for people to swipe their credit cards. They could all be based on this technology. So what you should be doing now is leveraging the power of your checkbook and calling these vendors and you start working with them and say, are you familiar with this research? I mean, even if any sort of embedded system like this, just call them up and say, I spend you know, X hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for my, my card readers at my front doors of all my buildings. You need to be working on this so that as this technology gets out there and people start really pounding on it, I know I'm secure or we have a process for addressing those vulnerabilities as they come up. Yeah, explain to me the role of security in your software development life cycle, Mr. Embedded Systems Developer. So with that one particular one, right, we don't have a lot of saturation. Moving on to the model, right, there isn't yet a lot of saturation of vulnerable technology and expectation from what you can get out of a parking meter, you know, remains to be seen. So we have lows kind of across the board. But as saturation factors change, right, the, the curve grows, right, we may actually find that we get a high here or a high there. We get one of these factors that jumps out, and therefore that makes the expectation increase significantly, and the curve actually rises. I mean, similarly, um, we, there were a couple of talks about cell phone, about mobile, you know, cell phone technologies. Um, in fact, this is the first year that we've had a dedicated track at Black Hat to mobile technologies. I mean, there have been talks in the past, but we had an entire day today of uh, where one track was dedicated to mobile technologies because they're increasing. You know, this hacking curve is starting to increase. Um, fortunately for us, um, the market is still, in terms of operating systems and devices, still very fragmented. So. Um, although there's a lot of cell phones out there, um, smartphones are a very small fraction of that market. Even at, you know, oddly enough, even at 50 million devices, that's actually a pretty small portion of the overall cell phone market today. Um, and, it's, and it's fractioned. There's Symbian, there's Windows Mobile, there's iPhone. So um, in general, if you hear that there's a mobile vulnerability, you probably don't need to worry about it in general. Um, however, case in point, several of the vulnerabilities that were released today are, are already being exploited. Um, so, again, as soon as something starts being exploited, you need to reprioritize because suddenly we already know that there's exploit utility to somebody because otherwise they wouldn't be exploiting it. So the, the, uh, the rate, your overall rating of the importance of this vulnerability needs to go way up as soon as you start seeing exploitable code being used. Can you open? So, so at the rate at which you disposition whether or not you make a decision, right, whether or not you're going to um, patch a system, whether you're going to address a vulnerability. Do, do, is this a rapid enough response, I guess is what I'm saying, because it looks like a pretty complex model. I mean, do you, do you, do you suppose we should, this should be used for making the day-to-day, -day, do we patch that system, uh, a decision? I mean, uh, I mean, can it be done that well? Cause it, it can be done that way. Um, this entire model, both the taxonomy and the graphical instance, has a, has a big assumption in it, which is that you know what you have that you have the operational discipline to maintain accurate asset records, that you know the state of those systems, in fact, so you know if they're vulnerable, you know, are they patchable, you have the ability to patch them or apply other compensating controls. For instance, turning off SMS or changing a firewall rule or now that Microsoft has addressed it, applying a kill bit. Um, the first couple of times, even if you have a good grasp of all your systems, it's gonna be kind of tricky. It's like learning a new, you know, a new card game or learning how to, you know, a new, a new trick on a skateboard or something, you're going to stumble, it's going to be a little slow. 
But after a while, I mean, you've done this. I mean, you're not going to a with anything like a risk assessment. The first few really suck. It's really hard. There's a lot of data to gather. But after a while, you get really good at it. You have a gut feel for it. And in fact, uh, there's a great book called How to Measure Anything by, is it Douglas? Yeah. By Douglas Hubbard that talks about relying on your expertise. Um, similarly, uh, you know, uh, Blink talks about this. If you're an expert in something, you can make very rapid, very accurate decisions about things because you have the prior knowledge to do that. So, you know, after a while, you know, you see new vulnerability come out. I mean, today, you hear about a new vulnerability and you look at it and go, we need to worry about that, or we don't need to worry about that. All we're trying to do here is give you a little more information to think about so you can make a more informed decision, and more importantly, when um, you get your weekly report from Verizon or Symantec, or you, know, you pick up the New York Times and see the list of vulnerabilities that were released at Black Hat, you don't go, oh shit, there's 38 vulnerabilities I need to worry about. You skim, skim through and go, well, I care about these two right now. This is something that we know we're going to be investing in in the near future, so we can you know, go back to our developers and say, um, this is something we should be addressing now before the code is released. Um, and then other things you can say, we don't have any of this technology in-house, we don't need to worry about it. And it takes all of five minutes. Um, so, so but it does suppose that you have good data about yes. your system. Yes. Well, any risk assessment assumes system. you have good data right. um, or, and that you have some good information at your disposal to make informed decisions. I mean, obviously, the very first time you walk out the front door of this hotel and you want to cross Las Vegas Boulevard, to go get a Starbucks or a beer or something, you're going to take a little bit longer before crossing the street because you don't know what the traffic patterns are like. You don't know how crazy the drivers are in Las Vegas and how drunk they are. By the fifth or sixth year coming to Black Hat, you know that they're really drunk and they drive really fast. Um, so you better really run. The one, one thing I, I would uh, I want to address because it's kind of ancillary to your question is um, measurement for the model. Um, we did not put it in. We don't want to have people fighting on the blog, although you, you can feel free to. Um, the difference between qualitative and quantitative and all that stuff. So if, if you really wanted to, you could probably, for e where each factor is intersect, you could do Bayesian look, simple Bayesian qual uh, qualitative lookup matrices type things. Alternately, if you really wanted to get quantitative, you could figure out how to get evidence to turn things into ratios, add Monte Carlo simulations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, you are creating a belief set statement. Um, and whether you're creating that belief statement as very low, low, medium, high, very high, or you're saying, mm, with a 90% certainty, I feel like you know, we have a significant or, or an 80% expectation of, of development, that, that's neither here nor there. Um, as far as we're concerned. Again, this is just to get it out and just to put it out there so that people will poke at it with a stick, really sharp stick. So we, we, we do have a question over here. Um, and while the, the microphone's going over there, we, I want to sort of highlight that Alex and I had two major motivations for doing this aside from the fact that we thought it'd be fun. Um, one is that we wanted to give people a tool, I mean, to do the comparisons and whatnot, but to communicate more effectively with executives. So that way they could go up and rather than say, my gut tells me that this is really bad, they can say, look, we have this pretty chart, and this is how it works, and this is how we do our day-to-day -day business, so they can show that they you know, are intelligently thinking about the issue. The other thing is, as Alex mentioned, we, blog, we both blog on the New School of Information blog. Um, it's, Adam it's based on Adam Shostak's book. And one of the prime premises of the book is that we need more data. Uh, if we're going to make informed decisions, whether it's in our own organizations or as a whole, you need to have data so you can make those decisions. And one of the things that's really slowing down our understanding of what, that what my curves look like here is that we don't really have a good idea of what hacking really looks like on a global scale. No one wants to talk to each other. Um, no one wants to share data um, with each other for fear of you know, litigation, for fear of looking stupid, for fear of losing market share, lots of reasons. Um, so as a result, the very few of the data sharing clubs that are out there have worked successfully. There are some exceptions. There's a particular one that I just heard about earlier this week involving the federal government that, uh, and some of the defense uh, contractors that has been very effective. Um, but in general, we lack data. And one of the things we're hoping is that people will apply this model and at a high level start sharing the data they're seeing because they can aggregate the data quite well, kind of like Verizon has done, and say, well, we took your model, we had to alter it this way, this way, and this way, and what we saw was these types of vulnerabilities rated higher than these and things like that, and here's what our general organization looks like without saying, we had this one finance system that was hacked and lost X number of credit card records. So we're hoping to get a little more information out there and people talking about it a lot more publicly. Question? I guess I'm trying to uh, understand how the initial deployment or development of the service, 
how you would change any of that, or do you still perform risk analysis, risk assessment before you, you know, deploy something, and then how does this follow in after that? Want to take that one, Alex? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm partial to a, a risk analysis framework called FAIR. And one of the things that FAIR does is it says, well, you have to have this concept called the frequency of threat offense in order to determine likelihood. And it's a little revolutionary in that way. That, that seems pretty obvious when, in, in retrospect, but you don't get that in, in many other likelihood determinations. Um, what this would do is say, hmm, we can t look at some state of nature concerning, f within the context of FAIR as a risk assessment tool, we can look at some current state of nature for threat event frequency, the frequency of, uh, at which we're seeing threat events. Now, this state of nature may be high, may be low, maybe whatever, right? But if it's low now, right, and, but we know that exploit code is probably gonna be, or, or we think exploit code might be developed, let's go and run it through this model and therefore see at what point we should really actually expect threat event frequency to increase. And that has an influence on future states of likelihood. It's very predictive. I, I don't like the, using the concept. It, you'll forgive me, but it's just a little pet peeve. The concept of calling these things predictive, because more times than not, you're really talking about a state of nature, uh, not a future state, um, or expected future state even. But uh, it, that's how I would be using this model um, if I were having to report risk assessments for a technology base that I owned within uh, a, a specific organization. Did I answer your question? Okay, thanks. Um, I see where your model talks about the nature of this discovering individual, but I don't really see anything on here about after the code's been disseminated and an exploit exists, the nature or objectives of the employer or the attacker. Right. Yeah, but yeah, so yeah, so just so I'm clear, it was that that would really fall for, at least for me, and I think Alex might agree, that falls under ease of use. Um, it's a sub-factor uh, around, you know, so, you know, if this tool is incredibly hard to use, so like, um, <clears throat> Moxie and Marlon Spike released a vulnerability. Uh, well, it wasn't really a vulnerability. He discussed an issue, several issues with SSL. Um, and they're really cool, but the fact of the matter is they're not the easiest things for someone to use. The, there wasn't an automated tool released with it. It takes a fairly motivated, fairly talented, technically savvy person to operate this. So that would fall under ease of use. Um, you know, this is not your class, you know, one of these, uh, you know, it, there's a Metasploit module for it, or there's a tool released for it to use it easily. And that's where that's, that all falls under ease of use. Um, um. What I'm talking about is more along the lines of, um, if, if you have a hacktivist, he may be just looking to do web defacement. Sure. Whereas if you're talking somebody going after a financial system for monetary purposes, organized crime, he's going to be looking at those kinds of exploits and looking for different specific types of exploits. He has an expectation of the information that the use of the exploit can provide him, in other words. Absolutely. Right. And so we tried to account for that, and maybe, maybe we don't do it to, to your satisfaction over there in information expectation. Um, it, it, yeah, that would be expected return. We had in an earlier version of the model expected market return, but then we thought, oh, hey, you know, people don't always do it for money. Right. Was there another question over here? Um, starting out, you've got the... Um, ability to compensate both under your expect this overall heading of expectation of development use. Do you see that or any of these other values as potentially overlapping with other parts of the assessment where ability to compensate plays in here, but then maybe you, as you're going through your other areas of judging likelihood, or maybe consequence, ability to compensate plays in a second time and effectively gets double counted. Yeah, um, you might, you may, and, and at this level of abstraction that we're, we're presenting the model, which is admittedly high in course, um, you may have another ability to compensate factor off of information expectation. So if you've got decent obfuscation, anybody here love the old saw, there's no such thing as security by obscurity, right? Yeah, you like that one? 
Yeah, I like it too. And and whenever when it, whenever I think about it, I think so. Great. Why aren't we painting all of our tanks pink? Because I bet we could get pink uh, tank paint a lot cheaper than camouflage. Um, <laughs> but but the, the information expectation um, bits there. Um, that, that might be, there might be a, an ability to compensate or apply a compensating control that we are obfuscating the value that the system has, right? If we name uh, a major system internally the cafeteria menu web server, but it's doing something else, right? The attacker's not gonna have any um, expectation that we're gonna get something back from the, from the asset. Now, in terms of exploit utility, it, it would we would he be con would he be doing that within the risk assessment itself? The is the question, right? So expected value of systems there. The red dot represents he's got to do a risk assessment that says, am I going to get caught? Right. So our ability to compensate there probably does have an influential factor on that red dot. We we have time for like one more question, and then we need to wrap things up. I didn't. I didn't answer to his, to his to his satisfaction, sir. You, yeah, come get me afterwards because you you're thinking about something and I like what you're doing. What? So let's work to let's work on it. <laughs> we can solve that in eight years. Yeah, uh, I, this may not be a, a question, more of a comment, I guess. But when you're when you're taking into account. Um, you know other aspects of the exploit you know rather than you know the the value of the system but more you know um, some sort of you know political gain or the fun of the exploit or whatever uh, you know it's all, it looks like almost like you should you should replace or swap the, where the expected return is and the expected value of the system like because the expected val expected return may ha would have um, you know may incorporate more than just the value of that system that's being exported. Yeah. Um, so what what we thought about doing additionally was having a fourth box there um, that would say you know uh, would kind of try and do what you're saying right. But when we kind of broke out, broke it out, you know, we were thinking, okay, so why do you, why do you bust on a system, right? Well, does it give me access to another system, right? Can I can I get access to another system and 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 you know, Sam play Sam and Lisa tricks, um, resources, right? That's why we have botnets, right? Because an exploit can provide us access to resources, um, and then we decided, well. The information on it is the third thing that they might be interested in. So they might be interested in the access, they might be interested in the resources that it offers, or they might be interested in the information that the particular computing but, system has. But to his point, the polit like political action or whatever might be another value placed on that system rather than quite, the three. Quite right. In general. fact, uh, case in point, and we, we completely missed this. Uh, there was a, a series of recent defacements of websites of security professionals who were here at Black Hat. Um, and that might fall under, you know, fame, some other sort of reason. Though I could also see that falling under access, after all. I mean, the whole point of it was just to get access to the system, to prove they had access to the system. Um, but there, and I, I agree, there's a potential for a fourth box. And we really struggled with that. We struggled with what do you do with the unintended, you know, sort of unintended hacking. Uh, yeah, where it's someone it's almost like the, that system, but just all systems. Yeah, it's almost like instead of instead of naming it expected value of systems, it should just be expected return, and then you'd have, you know, more of a generalized view into what people's motivations are. Well, we need more beer and wings and uh, coffee to figure that one out. I think. Okay, we should we should wrap things up. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank my panelists and see if they had any uh, last closing words of wisdom. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, hey, Jerry and Dan. Hey. Alex. And thanks for all the great questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.